Good morning, dear students. It's Haji Alim Kurum Ahmed from Istanbul Medipo University uh, International Business Development Unit. Uh, we are uh, a new unit actually in the university that is established to help international students. The main purpose is to help international students. So, uh, which means that as international students, when you want to apply to Medipo University or when you want to become a part of us, we call it like that most of the time, uh, you have a contact person, I mean, like a guide, international guide of yours in an office established only for you. So for this reason, in the student recruitment, student, uh, let's say registration period, starting from the very beginning, I mean, like you just find our website, which is mio.medipol.edu.tr when you click on it and click on apply button then immediately that application depending on your country on your passport goes to a person which is focused on your region who knows generally the let's say like i mean conditions of the country, I mean, uh, like legal issues, what you need, what you might need in your, uh, let's say, application process, let's say, starting from your equivalency period until uh, you get a visa and come here. So our members are helping you uh, through these issues. So as you know, like we have various programs approximately 129 different programs, which might take your interest. Like generally, when we think about the regions, for example, uh, I mean, let's say like when you go to Middle East, generally students want to study uh, medicine, dentistry, engineering. When you go to North, they're generally related to, uh, I mean, want to study some programs related to health sciences. So um, when you go to West, it goes to like business administration, like the, those stuff. So uh, regarding all of these, uh, we are prepared to help our students, give them a kind of like counseling, what is, which program is up to uh, whom, like depending on the skills, especially. So it's a little bit so deep issues, but when someone asks, us, like I want to study something but I'm not sure so we will give a kind of personal guidance to the students so uh, this unit as I told you that will be always there with their whatsapp numbers with their emails uh, which is easy to access not 24 hours with approximately like 12 hours something like that so will be uh, easy to access and help you so all right so we have an online system, like how to become a student at Istanbul Medipol University. Of course, like in this pandemic period, nothing can be like handing in any uh, like hard material, but uh, we do it online since the very beginning. We have a system which is, which will be shared also, mio.medipol.edu.tr. This is our website. When you click on it, it immediately pops up to you that would you like to become a medical university student? There you will click on apply now, and then you will see an application form and you will fill it in. It's a little bit detailed form, but which means that we won't be asking you any questions after your application. So everything will be done with a form. So with this online system, you make your application, fill in your personal information, education information, your background, and uh, you will upload uh, the documents which are asked by the university to be able to evaluate your application. So after that, in like two days, at most three days, you get a response from the university. So if there is a missing document, by the way, definitely you'll be sent an email or you will get a WhatsApp call from the person dealing with your, from the staff member dealing with your application. So after that, uh, every, after everything is provided, you will, uh, for, like I hope, 
you will become a part of Medipol University. But first, you get an offer letter from the university. We send an offer letter declaring every details in the offer letter, like where you will be, let's say, like checking your exam results and everything is included in the offer letter. It's like information, offer of the program, declaration. So it's that kind of a, let's say, compact document included in every necessary information. So after that, after you get it, there is a payment date that you will be using. Uh, you have to follow up. I mean, you have to comply with. Otherwise, you will miss your chance, but we try to help in those cases. So after the offer letter, we ask, we ask you to make the deposit payment until the specified time on the offer letter. Right after you do it, congratulations, you become a part of Istanbul Medipol University. You become a student, finally. And then uh, we prepare an e-signed official document by the university rector, which means that your money reached, you're in safe, and you're authorized to come to the university. So, after this issue, you will definitely apply for visa. So you will be able to apply for the visa with that document. And then um, like, you will want to get residence permit if you need. Generally, like European uh, students from European countries, they can come to Turkey without any visa or something for 90 days in 180, like, like in six months, you can come for 90 days, but generally students from like Arabic countries, like Gulf area, okay, from those areas, they must get visa to uh, come to the country. So for that reason, you can use that document. Also, we provide you student certificates starting from the very moment that you are registered in, that you will be taken uh, a student certificate, proving that you are a student. So, because our diploma is recognized in many countries, so you will be like, like for example, imagine you're studying medicine and you're from Iraq, okay? When you say that I'm a student at Medipol University and you will be recognized like, all right, yeah, this is a medicine student uh, in the university, which is like 600 plus ranking in uh, times higher education. So you will have a kind of like cool as an impact. So, all right. Uh, other thing is that we have like 40 applications, you know, okay, you made the application, you get accepted, you paid. But before that, before you pay, we offer you some scholarships. What are they? Imagine you are preferring uh, a department of let's say, medicine, dentistry, a pharmacy, law. If you prefer, if you choose one of these programs, uh, you will have a chance to get 30% scholarship, which is a good amount actually. So, and the prices go really down. Like due to pandemic, of course, we increased a little bit. Actually it was less before, but uh, after the pandemic, uh, we decided to increase the uh, the rates of scholarships. So, but this is for medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and law. And if you choose, let's say, any department except these I mentioned, uh, let's say like engineering programs, like School of Business, there are like 15 different programs, School of Health Sciences, School of Communication, um, school of Education, like there are nine more different faculties. So if you choose one of these, you will get approximately 50% scholarship, which is actually an amazing number. So uh, how do you get it? Like we give normally, like the first 20% we provided to the students because of pandemic. But there is a chance that you might increase this number. How you can do it? We will provide you a kind of US exam, okay? It will be online, that's our plan. Like it will be released, announced, like 
in a few days on our website that I told you. Uh, after it is announced, you can apply for it. Uh, you can take the test and you can increase the uh, percentage of the scholarship that you get from the university. There's a chance, definitely. And uh, so these are generally the aspects of how to become a student at Medipol University. But there are also other things to you, like not just becoming a student at Medipol University, it's like becoming a part of that huge family, accepting almost, which has almost like 35,000 students, which is a young university actually. And it has been the top ranked university in Turkey in the field of medicine and dentistry last year, in the previous year. So also with the percentage of 97 percentage of uh, project success in engineering faculty. So really good staff members, I mean professors, uh, facilities, definitely, together with like, like 10 hospitals and one of the biggest research centers of Turkey. So we are providing a good environment, an intellectual environment to our students. Also, uh, an easy issue to emphasize, I mean, easy and important, is that our dorms, when you become a student at Istanbul Medipol University, you have chance to live inside the walls of the university. Okay, imagine like, uh, like it's like, it's like Rome, okay, surrounded with some walls protecting university from the outside. Actually, the area is really safe, so there is no need to protect, but you must show your boundaries, I mean, like limits of the university. So imagine you're a student there, and if you want, and there will be seats, many seats, especially like, like 3,500 seats will be available for uh, in the dorms, like both for girls and boys separated. So you can uh, stay in the campus. Imagine like we have, okay, we have three campuses in total. One is Kawajik uh, North Campus, Kawajik South Campus, and Hadic Campus. Okay, imagine you are in Kawajik South Campus studying pharmacy, pharmacy English, okay? You're from, let's say like, Russia. So there is a girl's dorm and you're staying in that dorm. You have like, let's say your courses are at start at nine. So you just wake up 10 minutes before the lesson, like get prepared and like after two minutes, after three minutes, you leave the campus. I mean, uh, you leave the dorm, you'll be in your school. I mean, you'll be in your classroom. So like that's a good, let's say, uh, opportunity provided to the students. So uh, becoming a student at Istanbul Medipol University as an advantage, like both with its diploma, both with its uh, crew, like staff members, professors, etc., and the facilities it gives, I mean, serves to the students. So it's a good choice. So uh, this is uh, generally the general aspects of being as how to become a student at Istanbul Medipol University. So what we should know, what we should remember from this topic is that uh, the process, first you apply online and then we evaluate your kind of personal consultants is checking your documents checking your application, we evaluate it. And after that, we respond to you in a few days. Please, if you apply, you can like just text us on WhatsApp or something that I made an application, okay? Did you receive it correct? Well, we'll be in touch already, but to let us know, to accelerate the process, uh, it might help. And then uh, after a few days, you will get your offer letter, you will be asked to pay, then after you pay, finally, congratulations, you are a student at Medipol University. And then we will be informing you about the, let's say like time schedules, 
academic calendar. We will invite you. We will help you to get your visa from the embassies because you might have a problem due to the pandemic. But we will get in touch with your embassy because you will have someone in our office to help you a body of application. Application doesn't mean that studying at a university, applying doesn't mean that, all right, I applied now, okay, so paid, it's over. It's not over. We are always there to bring you to the faculty because if you don't come, what does it matter? If money is not the issue, like, it's not for Medipol University. Like we care about, uh, let's say, our students more than the like monetary issues, okay? So we must bring you here. We will get in touch with your embassy if you have any problem to get your visa. And then when you get here, finally, we will orientate you. And then you will start, you will adaptate yourself and you will enjoy this lovely city in this lovely university. Thank you so much. I'll be there all the time to help you. We are crew, approximately 20 people, and together with the intern students, we are like an army in the office. So we'll be trying to help you, uh, no matter what, no matter what time, we'll be there. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I am Naam Megar. I am a research assistant at Istanbul Medipol University Psychology Department. Uh, it is nice to meet you through this organization in this pandemic days. I hope you are all in safe and healthy. Today, I would like to introduce Istanbul Medipol University Psychology Department to you and the scope of psychology in general. Istanbul Medipol University Psychology Department gives education both in English and Turkish. Uh, the Department of Psychology adopted the educational norms of the Psycho Turkish Psychological Association, which also has a collaboration with the American Psychological Association. In Turkey, students graduated from a four-year psychology department, becomes a psychologist, and work in institutions as a psychologist. I would like to inform you our, about our aim and principles. We believe that an individual with a psychology degree should have a basic knowledge in the subfields of psychology, has a capacity to examine psychological concepts in depth and have a sound ethical, et, ethical background. To this purpose, it's really um, important for us to uh, ensure our students uh, have a strong theoretical background and understanding of methodology and the ability to establish a link between these two to carry out scientific research. So uh, our students uh, could be involved in research teams and research projects of faculty members. And um, we also care that our students adopt ethical values and social sensitivity in their professional activities. We aim to let our students see how psychology interacts with individual and social phenomena in daily life. Thus, we include internships uh, in both health institutions and non-governmental organizations within the scope of our undergraduate education. All courses in the Department of Psychology at Istanbul Medipol University are given by faculty members who are specialized in their field. In addition, in order to offer a wide range of elective courses, each semester we invite instructors from other institutions. In this way, students could develop themselves in accordance with their areas of interest. Before moving on to the subfields of psychology, I would like to say that there are many advantages of studying psychology in Istanbul. There are lots of psychology congress and seminars take place in Istanbul, and psychologists, researchers from other countries attend these events to make their presentation. 
You can also attend these events to expand your knowledge on psychology. Well, uh, what do I mean by the subfields of psychology? In general sense, psychology is interested in behavior, normal and abnormal functioning, mental and emotional problems. We work on these issues to understand both human and animals. I will describe uh, some of the subfields of psychology today. I would like to give definitions of these subfields of psychology that you can also uh, find at the website of the APA, American Psychological Association, in detail. First of all, I would like to explain clinical psychology. Clinical psychology focuses on understanding, evaluating, uh, and treating men mental and emotional disorders. For example, patients with depression or anxiety can consult a clinical psychologist for psychotherapy. Mostly students wonder uh, whether they could do therapy or see clients after their graduation. I need to say that being a psychologist does not mean being a clinical psychologist or psychotherapist. In order to uh, be a clinical psychologist, you need to have a master's degree in clinical psychology. Social psychology. Social psychology is defined as how individuals' thoughts, behaviors, uh, and feelings are influenced by, by other people or by their, their social and physical environments. Social psychologists study interpersonal relationships and group behaviors. They could also work on prejudice, discrimination, uh, and intimate relationships or aggression. Developmental psychology. Developmental psychologists study the human development, emotional and social and personal development across the lifespan. Hence, developmental psychologists focus on how understanding, perceiving, and behaving change from childhood to adulthood. Cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychologists study how people perceive, learn, or remember, uh, and think about information. So cognitive psychologists study language, problem solving, creativity, or decision making. Experimental psychology. Experimental psychologists are interested in exploring theoretical questions, often by creating a hypothesis and then testing it through experimentation. In psychology, uh, researchers use scientific research methods to collect data and to conduct a research. After explaining some examples of the subfields of psychology, now I would like to give some examples of courses that we focus on practical application of theoretical knowledge. As you can see, our students uh, could take courses on uh, child and adolescent psychopathology, play therapy, forensic psychology, or drug addiction. Following an initial discussion of the theoretical background, these courses allow students to practice acquired knowledge in class demonstrations or field practice. Psychology program uh, requires students to take a course on ethics in psychology to develop a strong uh, sense of professional ethics in psychological research and practice. In your lectures, you will also uh, learn about the cultural issues in psychology. Studying abroad might also give you a chance to observe behaviors, attitudes, or emotional reactions of people living in different countries. This could give you some research ideas for your future studies. In terms of career opportunities, Psychologists have a wide range of career opportunities, such as working at the psychiatric department of hospitals, at advertising companies, in schools, or human resources department of companies. 
I want to add that it is really important to specialize in an area of psychology to improve yourself. Actually, psychology education continues throughout your life. Lastly, I can summarize that we are interested in working on issues, what is happening all around us. Let's think about the last six months, coronavirus. Uh, how psychology could examine COVID-19? We know that the reaction of each person might be different according to their own uniqueness. And uh, we also had some common psychological reactions such as anxiety or distress. Within this period, psychologists try to explain psychological effects of traumatic events as we can evaluate uh, COVID-19 as a traumatic event. When we think uh, about the subfields of psychology, for example, we know that developmentally different age groups could show different reactions. And clinical psychologists think about the losses such as losing a job, or a death of a family member or a friend in this period. And also emotional reactions such as anxiety, sadness, or anger. In terms of re uh, relations from the relationship perspective, this period could affect our relationships with our family members, uh, with, with pe peers, or with your romantic partner in many ways. So when you study psychology, you will learn to evaluate a phenomenon from different point of views. I hope you enjoy your education life. Uh, thank you for your listening. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about the reasons and advantages of learning English language. So we will be sharing some uh, important information uh, and my name is Cemre Nuryavuz and uh, I'm going to share uh, some important significant information with my colleague is Gamze Uçak. So uh, before uh, continuing let's talk about some different kind of purposes of learning English language and of course there are some academic purposes behind uh, the learning English language process. Uh, when I ask my students, they mostly say that um, we learn English language because we can, we think that we can find jobs uh, easily when we graduate, which is true actually, because uh, when you uh, learn English language, if you know English language enough, uh, it makes you different from your, uh, let's say, colleagues and uh, most of the institutions and most of the offices uh, let's say they uh, looking they are looking for people who know English language enough and also let's talk about working abroad because uh, some of my students they say that they want to uh, work abroad rather than working in Turkey but to be able to work abroad you need to uh, learn English language because English uh, in the later slides I will show that English language is number one language spoken in the world so if you want to work different kind of people from different kind of countries, uh, English is the only channel that you can co make communication. So that's why you need to learn English language. And also getting education is another option, uh, is another reason to learn English language. But to be able to get education in another country, again, they ask for English language uh, level. So you need to prove that you know English language enough so that uh, you can get the education given from those kind of countries. And also uh, these, let's say you want to go to the USA or Canada or another European country uh, to get education. Uh, most of those schools, they ask for you to pay for the fees uh, rather than, and you can apply for a scholarship. Not only those kind of schools, but also some other institutions, they provide scholarships. But to be able to get these scholarship, you need to prove that, again, you, need, you, you know English language enough. And I think I, I, this is my favorite reason for learning English language, reading academic papers from other countries, because let's say you're a Turkish student uh, and you just know Turkish language. So that makes you limited because you can just 
access to uh, Turkish sources only. You can just read Turkish articles, Turkish books, that's it. But if you know English language, you can uh, get different kind of information from different kind of sources from lots of countries because most academic papers and most academic books, let's say, they are written in English language. So you can access those information and you can uh, enlarge your knowledge in your field. And also if you want to uh, follow an academic career, maybe bachelor degree is not enough for you. You wanna, you can uh, continue with your academic degree with master's uh, degree or PhD. Again, you need to learn English language to be able to do that because every, every school they ask for English language certificate to be able to uh, continue with master degree and PhD degree. Of course, uh, rather than academic purposes, there are some social purposes as well. So uh, on the screen, you see now a statistic chart, which shows that English language is number one language around the world. So it's the most spoken language. That means, that shows that English language is a global language actually. So to be able to um, have a communication without any problem with, uh, uh, with most people around the world, you need to uh, learn English language. Because if you like, let's say, traveling uh, a lot, uh, you can go to different kind of countries, you can visit those, those countries without any problem if you know English language, because you will probably find at least one person uh, to communicate with. And then, um, you can also meet new people and learn about different cultures thanks to English language because it, it, it makes you um, efficient enough in learning about and sharing uh, about uh, cultural things from your culture. And you can also learn about uh, those kind of people from uh, those kind of people's cultures as well. Uh, let's continue with this one. Yeah. Uh, also, English language uh, is number one language again on the internet and on social media. So, uh, internet and social media uh, are uh, in actually uh, one of the greatest and one of the most important things today uh, because we uh, people use uh, social media and internet uh, a lot especially these days because of the coronavirus, we, we are on the computer uh, most of the time. So uh, to be able to have internet literacy and to be able to use social media efficiently, eff effectively, uh, again, in English language uh, is important to know. English language is important to use effectively. So you should use English. You should learn about English language. And distance education, let's talk about this. I think it's the uh, trend, one of the trend topics today because of the coronavirus, we are following every, almost most uh, schools, they follow the distance education system right now. But I would like to talk about um, like online trainings and workshops given by different uh, universities around the world. So let's say you're a student in Turkey, but you want to know about uh, the workshops and the trainings in another country, let's say Harvard University or Oxford University or whatever. And so again, if you have English language enough, if you have the certain level of English language, you can get those kind of online trainings and workshops from different universities without any problem. And you can, again, enlarge your knowledge in your in your field you can develop yourself you can improve yourself in your field without any problem so um the next topic is the reasons of learning english in turkey but i like to uh leave this stage to my colleague gamza uçak hocam you can maybe share your valuable uh, information with our students student candidates Okay. okay, thank you, Jemre Hocam. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your valuable information as well. Mm -hmm. So probably all of you know, you need to learn English and you know the importance of English. But why should you learn English in Turkey? So I think we can talk about two important points here. Uh, one of them, in Turkey, different from other countries, we have one year of preparatory school. 
This is not a language school. And this preparatory school is a part of the university. And you will learn English for one year, every week, every week, five days. So it's a great chance to learn English and to read, write, listen, and speak in English, actually. Another reason is that Turkey has a multicultural environment. So here we have lots of people from different countries, ethnicities, and culture. So you can collect great experiences while having a chance to practice English. So, okay, we talked about Turkey. We can now move on to why should we learn English at Istanbul Medical University. So here we can talk about two headlines, let's say. The first is our academic emphasis, and the second one is the opportunities that our preparatory school provides. So in terms of our academic lessons, the most important thing is the emphasis on for, emphasizing four skills. Probably most of you have said or have heard the phrase, I can understand English, but I can't speak, or I can read in English, but I can't write. So this is mostly because unfortunately, English language teaching focuses on grammar a lot. Of course, grammar is important to some extent. However, in our university, we give importance to four skills, listening, reading, writing, and speaking and we assess your language accordingly. Similarly, we value process and production a lot. In yesterday's pr presentation, actually, we said that our evaluation system includes projects and portfolios. Both of them are about your production. But before your final product, we give you feedback in each stage. We check, correct, and make suggestions. Therefore, the process is as important as the production at our university. Another important point is here, you will have a chance to practice department-based language before you start your department with department-based projects and ESP lessons. ESP lessons, as you see, are English for specific purposes. In these lessons, you learn uh, some vocabulary and terminology about your department with students from the same department, preparatory school students from the same department. Okay, so when it comes to the opportunities that are provided by Medipol University, Medipol Preparatory School, we can mention two important ones, uh, Erasmus Plus projects and exchange programs. Actually, uh, as she has first-hand experience in this topic, I want to leave the floor to Jemra Hojan one more time to, build, uh, to give information about these projects. Jemra Hojan, can you please clarify on them? Of course, Ajam. Uh, Erasmus Plus projects actually... Um, it, they are really great projects, uh, and I recommend our candidate students to participate in one of at least one of those projects because uh, I participated in two Erasmus Plus Plus projects when I was in university, and I went to Czech Republic once, and then I went to uh, London. So uh, it, it was a really great experience for me because, um, of course, at the end of those kind of projects, they will get a certificate which is given by the European Union, but I think the most important thing in is, is was the experience that I had because I uh, when you go to Erasmus Plus projects there are lots of uh, students or lots of let's say they are not only students but also there are some you know uh, adults as well so you come together from different kind of countries and you try to uh, you you talk about some problems in your country and you try to uh, find a solution for this. The problem related to your society together, which is a, which is really great because I learn a lot. Uh, I learn a lot of things from those kind of people, and uh, it, it it also brings so many awareness uh, to you. Okay, so thank you very much, Jemra Hojan. So if you want to have further information, you can see the link here, and you can uh, talk to Zohail Hojan who is responsible for these projects, actually. So uh, another, uh, another point to underline is that our preparatory school has accreditation approved by Pearson, which means at the end of the academic year, you, can get, you will get Pearson approved certificates and you can make use of them within other more than a thousand institutions approved by Pearson. So it will be a great chance for you. Uh, let's talk about academic members uh, and our academic members in preparatory school uh, have lots of qualifications, let's say. Uh, the screen is out, but okay, I can continue with that. I guess I can share the screen just a second, so sorry about it. Um, where was it? Okay, I will find it in a second. 
there are some technical problems that can happen. So let's make it this way. Okay. Yes. So let's continue to academic members. Uh, we have 117 members and 83% of them are MA holders and five of them are PhD holders. And all of us are, actually have field related certificates. This means that we are constantly developing ourselves. Therefore, we become a very good sources for you throughout your journey of learning languages. And the last point uh, I'd like to mention is the uh, student clubs in the preparatory school. So we have four student clubs like speaking club, social responsibility club, recreational club, and drama club. So in social responsibility club, with the activities, you raise awareness on certain issues to be a more conscious member of the society. Activities are things like visiting senior centers, helping disabled people, feeding stray animals on shelters, and so on. In recreational club, students socialize and benefit from the facilities of Istanbul, so it's for fun actually, and activities include orienting, paintball, and tracking, and so on. And in speaking club, you have an extra chance to practice speaking apart from your lessons. It helps your language learning process. Within this club, you have uh, an extra hour to practice English with an instructor as well as your friends, your students, the other students around. And the drama club, which is my favorite club because I am the director within the drama club. So in drama club, you can develop yourself in acting, directing, and playwriting. This club, uh, actually within this club, sorry, what do we do? We prepare a musical throughout the year. We select you, then we have our, re our rehearsals. And at the end of the academic year, we uh, perform our musical in front of the language school students and your families as well. So I guess uh, this is all that I wanted to say. So if you have any questions or any comments, Jemna Hocam, I hope I didn't skip I, I any am part. Back. I am back, yeah. by the way. Is, sorry, I think it's because it, it was because I'm in internet connection. I got the, I lost the connection. Okay, but I think you, you didn't fine. have so, a problem with, uh, with the presentation, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you for your participation and for your listening. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Hello, dear candidates. My name is Zafar Shahin. To briefly introduce myself, uh, I finished my pharmacy degree in Anadolu University in Eskishehir, and I've been working for Istanbul Medipol University since uh, 2013. And that's why I'm one of the best person to talk about studying pharmacy in Istanbul, because I know disadvantages and the advantages of the, uh, studying in Istanbul compared to other places. Uh, first of all, it's a distinguished faculty to look up to pharmacy faculty's position. Uh, it's a distinguished faculty amongst all other license programs. And it's the oldest health science amongst all health sciences like physiotherapy, like uh, uh, health sciences, like medicine or dentistry. It has a wide scientific coverage actually this is not uh, a subject that people are aware of it, but it has a very wide scientific coverage. And number of faculties are less than the other uh, faculties like medicine or dentistry. And this also make pharmacy uh, distinguished. And it has five year education process compared to other four year license programs. And this allows you to start PhD just after your bachelor's degree without master. Of course, you can still uh, able to make master, but you don't have to do master before PhD. Here, you can see the pharmacy faculties in Istanbul for all uh, faculties. There are total number of 12 faculties in Istanbul. Three of them uh, are government schools and nine of from our private schools. For example, here, the Hertz uh, the 
signed by the Hurd is Istanbul Medipol University and the others are the other universities in Istanbul. Four, five of them is at the Asian side and the other ones are at the European side. Actually, pharmacy is a family. In Istanbul, uh, there are 12 faculties, as I said before. There is no competition between them, but there is synergies. You can find synergies in between the faculties and you can join even in your first year to these associations. Actually, the abbreviations for all these associations, associations are same and finishing with UPSA means University Pharmaceutical Students Association. If it's Medipol University, it's Medupsa. If it's Istanbul, it's UPSA. And if it's Marmara, Mupsa, and like this. You can reach out their social media links uh, from Twitter or Instagram, and you can look up their uh, social activities or other scientific or communication activities. You can check them from here. Actually, this situation is not same for the other uh, bachelor degree programs. This is special for pharmaceutical students and it's a very conservative uh, association. And we talk about the social facilities of the st uh, studying in Istanbul. You can find all kind of pharmacies in Istanbul, you can observe them. You can observe how they are working, uh, what they are doing. For example, a mall uh, pharmacy, and you can find a cosmetic pharmacy. You can find a traditional pharmacy. You can find the oldest pharmacy in Istanbul, in Kadıköy, and you can observe them. Maybe you can arrange uh, internship for uh, different pharmacies in your, uh, in during your semester or in summertime and you can arrange uh, many different internships in these different kind of pharmacies. And 14 of May is celebrating for Pharmacist Day in Turkey, as you know, and usually pharmacy faculties arrange programs for 14 of May and people find a chance to meet uh, persons from different uh, brands, for example, from industry, from academic, and from uh, job. And people usually meet other person here and we celebrate. It's usually with boat trips and we also arrange conferences and seminars. And at the same week, we usually uh, arrange basketball tournaments and as we have many faculties in Istanbul, we are able to arrange these kind of tournaments or organizations. So this is a tradition, except for this year because of COVID-19. And another opportunity is conferences. Of course, Istanbul is a metropole. So many conferences are organizing in Istanbul. One of them is AlphaCon which is organized by Istanbul Medipol University School of Pharmacy and the Medupsa collaboration. And this organization uh, gives students better perception and awareness. Uh, awareness as uh, students are entirely involved in this organization. As you can see from this picture, uh, all these persons are our students or were our students. And third AlphaCon is also delayed to 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can find details about AlphaCon website, uh, what they are doing. And what are the job and internship opportunities to study in Istanbul? Uh, to look up to what pharmacists do after bachelor's degree, they can uh, operate individual or hospital pharmacy. Uh, they can join academic uh, people. Uh, they can work in the industry. It can be research and development or other branches such as warehouses, production, culture control, uh, marketing, medical departments, pharmacovigilance, and other type of industry branches and others. 
For Istanbul, you can reach out all of these easily. For example, if you want to experience academic uh, process, you can talk your supervisors or your uh, coach and they can direct you or you can go different universities. Uh, as I said before, you can find different type of uh, pharmacies and you can open or work in them, in hospitals or in individual pharmacy faculties. You can take part in research and developments because many of the uh, drug companies is located in or around of Istanbul, so you can find job. Uh, even some of them is located in the Kavacik in Beykoz, which is uh, in the same place with our campus. And others are government's positions. All of these are easily accessible from Istanbul. You can uh, find any of them. Opportunities as a student living in Istanbul. For a student living in Istanbul, they can easily be accustomed to atmosphere and other opportunities is uh, same for all. A student living other states, like me, I studied in uh, Eskishehir, but if I were uh, with the brain I have now, uh, I would prefer to study in Istanbul because you can find a big environment and culture here. You can establish permanent, uh, permanent friendship and relationships. Of course, you can find job options and there are innumerable uh, people who have started to live in Istanbul after their graduation. And for a student coming from abroad, which is a potential, for you, for the English faculty. Uh, with running airports in Istanbul, is easy to reach from all over the world. And with its multicultural property, it will make you sophisticated. And Istanbul is a big metropole, which can be taught either as a job facility or a step to move Eastern or Western countries. And finally, I want to uh, summarize you some career examples. For example, Elif Chala, she has done many internships in the drug companies and started one of them and working in clinical research as soon as graduation and being worked uh, in a new position for one year. She's just third part. And Nadia Kadayevchu, this is another uh, interesting example. After she had finished school, uh, she arrived in the United States and she has passed the equivalence exams to be a pharmacist in the United States. Uh, and she is now able to work as a pharmacist in the United States. Ashraf, Esra, and Aishegul, and there are other people also. These persons are uh, graduated from Istanbul Medipol University and they are employed by Istanbul Medipol University School of Pharmacy. They are working as research assistant and they are doing uh, their master or PhD degrees. Elif Kuner, she was among the first graduate people. She had started to work in Medipol Mega Hospitals as pharmacy and simultaneously, she had started to clinical pharmacy PhD program in Istanbul Medipol University. Now she has transferred to another uh, hospital as chief pharmacist and still studying on her PhD. Onur worked in a conference, in a conference, IVEC is a very big conference. Uh, he worked as associate director and worked in industry and now he has opened a private pharmacy in Istanbul. And Cengizhan, after graduation, started to work here, Istanbul Medical University, like us. And he is transferred to Konya Sarchuk University in his hometown. And he is still doing his PhD in Istanbul. And many of students found their career 
and we also want to host you here and we want to help you to find your ways. And if you prefer us, we will be happy to welcome you here. Uh, thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions, I can take it. Okay. Uh, dear prospective students and dear friends, it is my pleasure to appear before you and give a brief information about law school education at Istanbul Medipol University. Uh, then I will try to explain a topic uh, we discussed during the uh, European Union law class at Medipol entitled as the latest developments in the EU-Turkey relations. By the way, my name is Salman Karakul. I'm an uh, associate professor of public law and human rights law at Istanbul Medipol University since 2015. The, the School of Law at Medipol aims to train professionals who are equipped with a solid inside of law and legitimacy. And uh, our law school can contribute to society as lawyers, attorneys, prosecutors, and judges. The law education uh, lasts for four years plus one year English language uh, preparatory program for uh, the students whose English level is not adequate for attending to the law school directly. Language of education uh, at Istanbul Medipol uh, Law School is 30% English and 70% Turkish. Interested students are also offered integrated intensive language training uh, courses, especially for those whose mother language uh, is not Turkish. Uh, because, you know, 70% uh, of our law classes are in Turkish. Istanbul Medipol University law students are encouraged to attend the certificate programs and uh, Erasmus exchange program with partner universities abroad during their university uh, studies. With experienced lecturers and faculty members, a rapidly developing library Istanbul Medipol University Law School is becoming a prominent law school in which national and international students will obtain a qualified law education. Our law school aims at equipping students with both theoretical knowledge and practical skills that they will be able to use in their future career. I am pleased to inform you that our graduates are practicing as lawyers judges, prosecutors, and academics so far, and we are really proud of having such brilliant uh, colleagues. Now it is time, uh, I guess, to shortly discuss the latest developments in the EU-Turkey uh, relations here. As a uh, senior candidate country to the uh, European Union, Turkey has unique relations with the Union unfamiliar to any international relations, either between states or uh, between states and international or regional organizations. Apart from the geographical dis discussions whether Turkey uh, was located and belonged to Middle East and Asia or Europe, political, economic, and cultural grounds seem to be more available to analyze Turkey's unending efforts to become a European uh, country. Turkey-EU relations have ups and downs through the history as we live in an uneasy period for the moment. Nevertheless, mutual economic and political interests always took priority over the short-term tensions between the two actors up to now. Neither Turkey nor the EU could take the risk of ruining the relations, although severe disagreements existed between the parties several times before, which means that common sense prevailed over the politically and culturally motivated objections. Reasons for unstable relations between Turkey and the EU can be listed as follows. Firstly, the organic and functional transformation of the EU in a relatively short period of uh, time from an economic community, you know, a uh, closed union. Uh, secondly, the rise of populism and extremist political views in the EU uh, countries, especially Islamophobia of the far uh, right parties, political parties in the EU countries. And the third one 
internal development such as frequent military interventions and unstable political conditions in Turkey, unfortunately, you know, we experienced such a uh, military intervention uh, in 15th of uh, July in 2016. International uh, developments such as, uh, the third one is international developments such as frequent uh, military interventions and unstable uh, political conditions in Turkey. This is about internal situation. But the fourth one, external developments such as the Cyprus issue, it's quite important and a mass immigration uh, from uh, Syria that we face. The customs union between uh, the U uh, European Union and Turkey was adopted in uh, 1995 and came into force in 1996. It should be emphasized that Turkey is the sole country, sole candidate country establishing a customs union with the EU before becoming a full member state of the union. Turkey is the unique example. Since the beginning of the EU-Turkey relations, uh, I mean, there has been surely some ups and downs, but since the beginning of the EU-Turkey negotiations in 2005, only 16 chapters of the acquis communautaire, we call the whole EU legislation, I mean, whole compendium as acquis communautaire, uh, which means that uh, I mean, that comprise uh, treaties, uh, protocols there to regulations, directives, decisions, and so on. So only 16 chapters of the uh, Aki Communitaire were opened out of 35 uh, chapters, and only one of them was provisionally closed. It seems that the negotiation process proceeds very slowly in comparison with the other candidate states uh, and the member states of the EU. One of the obstacles uh, on the opening of new chapters is Turkey's non-application of Ankara Agreement with regard to Cyprus government, a member of the EU since uh, 2004, which is not recognized by Turkey as the legitimate Republic of Cyprus. Accordingly, the Cyprus government opposes to the opening of certain negotiation chapters with Turkey only for uh, unfortunately, political reasons. Further obstacles uh, to the negotiation process are the lack of uh, political support by the governments of the EU member states and the immigration uh, issue. It can be uh, said that the EU-Turkey negotiation process is in a deadlock state and it seems quite difficult to overcome the obstacles in the short term. In the course of struggling with the negative effects of uh, last financial uh, crisis since the end of uh, 2009, you know, the EU has faced new challenges uh, of the immigration, uh, terrorism, Brexit, new nationalism, and lastly, COVID-19 pandemic issues. Although the future uh, of the European integration process is questioned as a result of these difficult situations, new prospects and perspectives for the European countries still exist. And it may result in finding a new vision to overcome these challenges. Excluding the issue of Brexit for the moment, Turkey is directly affected by or related to these new developments uh, which have economic, political, cultural, and legal aspects. Since the bilateral relationship between the EU and Turkey will be maintained in one way or another, the future of the European integration process is likely to affect the position of Turkey in the new European uh, order. Uh, of course, there are uh, many more topics that we can discuss uh, with regard to the latest developments in EU-Turkey relations, but I guess uh, I should stop here and uh, I should uh, uh, ask whether you have any questions now or uh, at a later time. If you don't have uh, any questions, uh, then uh, I should stop now and thank you for your attention. And uh, I should inform you that I will please to answer your questions at any time. You can contact me by email. My email address is skaraqul at 
medipol.edu.tr, you can ask any questions either about uh, legal education at Medipol University or any other legal questions, especially uh, about uh, Turkish legal system and law education in uh, Turkey. I would like to thank you and I hope you have the best chance in your future endeavors and thank you. Everybody, uh, thank you for your coming at first. Handa Soy from Continuing Education Center at Istanbul Medipol University. Uh, I want to talk about uh, three main topics, actually. One of them, good reasons uh, to study in Turkey and also in uh, Istanbul Medipol University. Second one is who we are. And the last one is lifelong learning. Uh, that's all. Uh, our country is a, a popular study destination with many prestigious universities, as you know. Uh, we have high uh, standards of education, uh, multicultural society. Uh, our country has really so strate strategic uh, location with East and the West, as you know. So everybody who has different uh, cultural cultures and also faiths can feel at home. It's so important, by the way. Uh, we are hospitable uh, and also we, uh, we enjoy meeting uh, foreigners and practicing English. Uh, and the most uh, other reason, uh, we have a rich history and you can visit the historical places as you want. Uh, and then let's talk about uh, our, our, our university now. Um, Istanbul Medipol University uh, vision is to be is to become a leading university globally and to provide scientific uh, results to contribute to the social development. Uh, and also we have latest technologies for all measures by the way, it's so important for the education. Uh, our university includes applied and health research center with the latest uh, equipment. Uh, our university is an important center for various sports uh, champion, championships. And also we have a lot of photography competition, uh, concerts and various student clubs. And now, uh, who we are. Actually, I want to talk about the Continuing Education Center. Istanbul Medipol University Continuing Education Center adopts as a principle to raise awareness of science and technology on individuals, recognizes and meets the changing and developing society's needs and contributes to society and universal, universal science. Let's we look over the uh, our course programs all together right now. Um, we separate the, all of the programs five main topics. Uh, one of them foreign language. It's so uh, foreign language courses are very uh, famous uh, at uh, our department. Uh, English, Arabic, German, uh, Spanish, Italian. Uh, and also medical, uh, medical cor uh, Turkish course for foreigners uh, are uh, most uh, famous. And the second uh, main topic, medical courses, speech and uh, language therapy course, uh, home care service for seniors, patient care course, uh, first aid training, uh, audiology training, etc. Uh, and third is uh, traditional medicine. Um, actually, uh, one of the, our strong sides side is the traditional medicine. Uh, traditional uh, medicine course uh, is important and also so uh, scientific. Acupuncture, apitherapy, aromatherapy, uh, homeopathy, uh, cupping, larva, mesotherapy, music therapy, ozone therapy, etc. And the other uh, topic is law, uh, peacemaking training, basic expertise training, 
uh, expert training, uh, qualified calculation based trade reform legislation. And the last one, uh, in my opinion, it's so important for all the uh, students, personal development. Becoming a winning leader, taking action and being productive. The art of speed reading, art of oratory education, leadership communication oriented, that's all. Uh, and most important point is life lo uh, lifelong learning. We build all of the training program uh, around this aim. The importance of lifelong learning, uh, lifelong learning refers to pro uh, process of gaining knowledge uh, and learning new skills uh, throughout your life. Many people continue their education for personal development and fulfillment, uh, while others see uh, it is a sign spent step toward career advancement. Whether pursuing personal interest and patience or chasing professional ambitions, lifelong learning can help us to achieve personal fulfillment and satisfaction. Uh, lifelong learn, uh, sorry, lifelong learning has really uh, important four benefits. Renewed self-motivation, recognition of personal interest and goals, improvement in other personal and professional skills, and the last one, improved self-confidence. Let's look over then, uh, renewed self-motivation. Sometimes we get stuck uh, in a rut uh, doing things simply uh, because we have to do them. For example, like uh, going to the work, cleaning the house, et cetera. Uh, figuring out uh, what inspires you puts you back in the driver's set and uh, is a reminder that you can really do think, uh, things in life that uh, you want to do. Second is uh, recognition of personal interest and goals. Re uh, Reuniting what makes you, uh, you tick uh, as a person reduce boredom, makes life more interesting, and can even open future opportunities. You never know where your interest will lead you if you, uh, if you focus on them. Improvement in other personal and professional skills. While we are busy learning a new skill uh, or acquiring new knowledge, we are also building other valuable skills that can help us in our personal and professional lives. This is because we utilize uh, other skills in order to learn something new. For example, learning to see requires problem solving. Learning to draw involves developing creativity. Skill development can include uh, interpersonal skills, creativity, uh, pro problem solving, critical thinking, leadership, reflection, adaptability, and much more. And the last one is improved self-confidence. Becoming more knowledgeable or skilled in something can increase our self-confidence uh, in both our personal and professional lives. In our personal lives, the confidence can stem from the satisfaction of devoting time and effort to learning and improving, giving us a sense of accomplishment. In our professional lives, the self-confidence can be the feeling, feeling of trust we have in our knowledge and the ability to apply what we have learned. Your ability uh, to expand your mind and strive for lifelong learning is critical to your success. By dedicating your
can get ahead in every aspect of your life. Learning is minimum requirement for success in your field. Information and knowledge on everything is increasing every day. This means that your knowledge must also in increase to keep up. We are always here uh, when you want to improve yourself. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you for your organization again. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming and, and thank you very much for your interest in Istanbul Medical University and also in my talk. Uh, I am Assistant Professor Yusra Don and here I am in the departments of Industrial and Biomedical Engineering. And like yourselves, when I was your age, when I was out of high school, I was uh, looking for a university abroad and I can actually understand your excitement and I already wish you all the best and I hope that you will find the best match for yourselves and for your interests. So with that, I will start my talk and today I will give you a very basic introduction into AI and its applications in healthcare. Okay, so why AI is of course short for artificial intelligence and when we say artificial intelligence, we basically refer to machines or computers that can uh, mimic functions that we normally would recognize as human functions or the brain functions, cognitive functions. So for example, when we talk about learning something, this is something that we consider as human. Okay? When we talk about problem solving, that is something that we consider as a human ability. But now with artificial intelligence, we can have machines and computers that can actually perform tasks where they are learning things and where they are solving problems. And that is what we are referring to when we say artificial intelligence. So the field of artificial intelligence, of course, encompasses many areas. And the most important ones are listed in this figure. And those are machine learning, and they're based on neural networks, deep learning, natural language processing, uh, with the many images that we are now sharing, computer vision has become very big, and cognitive computing. These are all very important areas of artificial intelligence. So right now, I want to give you a very, very simple example about artificial intelligence so that you can understand what we are saying when a computer is learning or when it's problem solving. So now consider that you have an email server. So all of us have emails and we have an email server and then we receive an email, okay? And we see that this one of our emails has come from an unidentified source and has a content uh, that can actually even be harmful or that we didn't want. Want. So we can mark this email as spam, okay? And as we keep receiving more emails and as we keep seeing more spam, we keep marking more emails as spam. So now the machine learning algorithm that is behind those email service can recognize what we are classifying as spam and what we are considering as acceptable email. So as we keep marking more email as spam, the computer can learn how to actually tell that an email is spam or not spam. So actually nowadays in our uh, email services, we already have a built-in folder that is called spam and the email of that sort automatically can get categorized as spam, okay? And that is because the machine learning algorithm behind that service has been trained to recognize this uh, email. So it has learned what is spam and what is not spam. So the more email that we receive, okay, and the more examples of 
regular mail and spam, this algorithm sees, the more successful the algorithm becomes in actually separating the two. So the accuracy of the algorithm starts increasing. So this is an example of how a machine learns by example. Okay, so this is called machine learning and this is a type of artificial intelligence. So now let's, we, we said we're going to talk about artificial intelligence in healthcare. So let's talk about healthcare. So when we are considering healthcare, we, it actually um, covers all, almost all people who have at any time in their life seen a doctor. So this is now almost from birth onwards. And when you go to a health provider, when you go to see a doctor, a hospital, the first thing that they do is they take your information, okay? who you are and all of your uh, necessary personal information. And your record is get being kept. So of course, earlier, the records have been kept on paper, but nowadays everyone keeps their re records digitally. So we have now EHR systems or electronic health record systems where the information of uh, everyone, uh, be it a patient or healthy person who has visited a provider is being kept. Okay, so now the first thing is whether to tell this person is healthy or has some sort of sickness. Okay, so now after your record is started, you go see a doctor. And when you start uh, explaining your situation, you start telling the doctor whether you have pain, why you are not feeling well, and you give the doctor some information about yourself. And this information that you first start to give is verbal information. So it's unstructured information that the doctor keep notes of. And then, as a next step, as the doctor wants to, as the doctor wants to see uh, whether you have a certain uh, illness, they will prescribe some tests. So you might get a blood test. So now your information is being collected in the form of a blood test, or you can get an ECG graph. Your uh, blood pressure will be measured. Maybe your blood sugar will be measured. So you are going to get information from all of these tests. If need be, you will be referred to some medical imaging like X-ray or MR or CT scan. So then you will have information in the form of some images. And if the doctors uh, see fit, maybe they will collect some genomics data and proteomics data. So from a single person, a variety of data is going to get collected. So now, when we look at the data that we have in our healthcare system, we can see that uh, even from a single person, we have a lot of information. And of course, this is not limited to a single person. We have millions, billions of people whose uh, records that we are keeping. So the data that we have in the healthcare system is actually what we call big data. So big data is the type of data that has some properties. So the first property is that it is very large in volume. So you have a lot of data. So now we have in the healthcare system, a lot of data from many sources because we have millions of billions of people uh, who are seeing doctors. Then there is the variety of the data. So we don't just collect one type of information. We collect all types of information. We collect verbal information. We collect test results. We collect images. So the variety of the data is also very big. And then there is the velocity of the data. So we are generating data at a very high speed. So thousands of people are actually visiting doctors every day, millions of people. So we keep getting new information every day at a very high rate. Then we have the other qualities that are called veracity. So whether you can trust the data that you have, the value, where the value in your data actually lies. 
the variability. So how you can actually use this data. So many ways in which you can actually format and use this data. So the type of the data that we have in the healthcare system is actually uh, very um, important in the field of artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence basically helps us deal with this kind of data. It is very difficult for a single doctor or even for a group of doctors to have a look at this big data and on their own to draw conclusions or to make the analysis. So artificial intelligence makes it easy for us to make the analysis and to gain uh, valuable insights from this sophisticated big data. Okay, so now that's why artificial intelligence is very important for our healthcare system. And we can see that in the healthcare system, we are already uh, seeing developments uh, with artificial intelligence in many fields. So if we now divide the healthcare sector into four parts, and talk about patient care, diagnostics, uh, research, and management as four different fields, we can see that artificial intelligence is actually contributing in all those different fields. So for patient care, for example, from the moment when a patient walks in uh, to a, a provider, this is how we are assisting the patient, how we are uh, taking their uh, information, how we are analyzing their information, and how we are helping them manage their journey. Okay, so in all those areas, we can have help from artificial intelligence. Okay, the next area is diagnostics. So this is when we actually identify what is the disease of the person, okay? And with the help of artificial intelligence, we can now actually reduce the errors that we are making. So if a doctor used, for example, made an error and uh, diagnosed you with the wrong disease, okay? And these things can happen, but we see that with artificial intelligence, we can prevent this or we can reduce these kinds of human errors. And then uh, medical imaging is an important part, part of diagnostics uh, because we get a lot of scans, we get a lot of images. And from those images, doctors are trying to uh, predict or pinpoint what is wrong with us. So, and it can be very uh, daunting actually to differentiate between images of a healthy person and a diseased person. Those differences can be actually very subtle. And with the help of uh, computers, we can actually detect these subtle insights, which can be uh, very difficult uh, to the human eye, okay? And with the help of artificial intelligence, we can now gain insights into diseases. And this actually at the end helps us diagnose diseases early. And early diagnosis is very crucial because the earlier you can uh, pinpoint a disease, the earlier you can actually start the treatment and you will increase the chances uh, for uh, recovery for your patient. Okay. Another area is research and development. So this is where we are coming up with new treatments new medicines and uh, new ways of treating patients and where gene analytics are uh, being made. And this area is also benefiting largely from artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence can help us say whether a drug is suitable for a person. Even if two different people have the same disease, a drug may be suitable for one, but not for the other. And with the help of AI, we can actually uh, sometimes uh, differentiate that. And we can come up with new and more effective drugs. And the last area 
is management. So this is where uh, the market research for pharmaceutical companies come in. This is where how much you need to pay for your healthcare comes in, how uh, brand management, insurance, and all those things are actually happening comes into the management in the healthcare industry. And this uh, area as well is uh, benefiting from uh, AI. And here in this figure, you can see in all of these areas, we, can, we already have companies that have made contributions into each area with the help of artificial intelligence. And of course, uh, as you keep increasing uh, the AI applications, as you keep in increasing efficiency, you start to save uh, in money, okay? You start to save economically. You, and the cost savings that can actually come from AI applications are considerable. So here you see a list of areas or a list of applications and their potential contributions to cost savings. And as you see, they range from 40 billion for robotic assisted surgery to maybe uh, 2 billion in the latest, in the at least for cyber uh, security. So there is a potential of hundreds of billions of dollars to be saved with the help of AI applications and that money can be used uh, elsewhere to increase the quality of life. So AI is helping us actually increase the quality of treatment and patient care and also reduce the cost of health services. Okay, and here is another slide that shows startups that are already transforming healthcare. And uh, of course, these are not, uh, this is limited to this slide. There are many companies from all over the world that are actually contributing to the health industry. Okay, so let me give you some exciting examples of AI in healthcare that are actually happening today. So one of them is, uh, what you see here is a robotic surgery. So this is a Da Vinci robotic surgery uh, picture. And here you see that the surgeon is actually operating from a computer. So he's looking into something like a microscope and he's operating with his hands but he's not operating directly on the patient. So you see the robot arms that are actually making the incisions, that are cutting uh, the tissue in the patient, and that are making the necessary surgical uh, procedures inside the body of the patient. So now instead of the surgeon working with his hands on the patient, he is actually using very intricate needles okay, that need to cut, that don't need to cut as large into the body of the person. And that can actually uh, make less damage to the tissue as they're operating and have better precision at surgery. So the surgeon is still uh, is still working on the patient, but he's working with the help of these robots and he's reducing the invasiveness of the surgery. Okay, so uh, this is one example and now we are seeing robotic surgery in uh, many hospitals. So it's becoming more and more commonplace and it helps the patient uh, to actually heal much easier. So another thing that is actually infiltrating into our homes is the virtual nurse. So for example, let's say you have a disease that needs to be monitored. So let's say you are a patient that has uh, diabetes. So you need to uh, monitor your blood sugar continuously. So <laughs> this company now has a virtual nurse assistant. So you can have that in your uh, smartphone or on your tablet. And 
with the help of this virtual nurse, you will actually keep track of all the uh, regimens uh, that the doctor has prescribed to you and all the uh, measurements that you are make, that you have to make at home. And the virtual nurse is actually going to detect when there is something off and it can alert your uh, doctor. Even maybe uh, it will happen even if, when, if you have continuous monitoring, even if in your sleep, if something goes off with the help of the nerd, virtual nurse that is continuously monitoring you, your clinician will be alerted and you will be able to get the help that you need. So this is as if you have someone by your side taking care of you at all times. So as you can imagine, uh, old people that are who are uh, in nursing homes or who need to um, live on their own, but who need assistance are going to find a lot of value in such applications. Okay. So another one is IBM's Watson. So this artificial intelligence algorithm that IBM has developed and that is called Watson is now uh, being used with the uh, cancer uh, care centers. For example, Sloan Kettering is a very important cancer center and now they are incorporating IBM's Watson technology into their procedures. So a doctor is going to actually benefit from all the information that uh, IBM Watson can actually collect and analyze uh, for a particular case, for a particular uh, patient, and will help the doctor diagnose, di diagnose the disease uh, much more accurately and also help choose a treatment method that will work for that particular person. Not a general method, that is going to be applied commonplace to everyone, but a personalized treatment that, that will be prescribed to a patient. Okay. Another development is uh, with NVIDIA, which is another big tech company. Now, their artificial intelligence ha has uh, joined forces with UK's public health system, and they are analyzing medical scans across the entire public health system. So by analyzing those scans, they're hoping to uh, get information, for example, about genetic uh, diseases and so on. Google has joined forces with a company called DeepMind, okay? And together now they have an artificial intelligence that can detect uh, 50 types of different eye diseases. So uh, that is a very intricate and a, a very sophisticated technology that can differentiate between all of these different eye diseases and detect them. So on another front, on the electronic medical records front, now we see in Canada and all in many different countries, here also in Turkey, we see electronic medical record systems that keep the information from the very entry into the system until a person is being dismissed. And even these records are being kept uh, lifelong. So all of this data is being collected and you can access your own data very easily. You can see your test results. You can read your own test results from your uh, smartphone or, um, and all of those information can be used actually to see uh, the health uh, situation for the general public as well. And for our days, an important uh, uh, discovery is uh, that comes from an academic university and with the help of AI, they can now distinguish between the scans of pneumonia and COVID predictions. So this is very important in our days, of course, whether you have pneumonia or COVID can be um, a tricky situation. And with the help of AI uh, from these uh, scans, uh, you may be able to distinguish between the two. Okay, 
So I hope with these examples, I could get you uh, excited about uh, AI in healthcare. And now you might ask, why would I choose Medipol uh, to actually pursue this field? And here at Medipol, uh, we actually consider ourselves to be a great hub uh, for uh, innovation for healthcare because we have one of the biggest uh, hospital networks in Turkey under our umbrella, which is the Medipol Hospital Network. And in conjunction with this, we have one of the best medical schools and we have one of the best engineering schools. So now we have access to data from very advanced hospitals. We have access to doctors and we have access to the knowledge of the doctors and when we combine that with the technology that we are uh, that we are producing here at the engineering school, we are actually at a very good position to innovate solutions for healthcare. So I told you that I am actually in biomedical and industrial engineering here, and let me give you an example of what I'm doing. And I am collaborating uh, with doctors. Uh, from Medipol and we are trying to identify Parkinson's patients from the MRI scans that we are collecting at our hospitals and we are analyzing those scans with deep learning methods so that we can actually identify uh, a Parkinson's patient and we can classify these patients uh, according uh, to their uh, disease types. So this is an example of what I'm doing, but of course here we are not limited to my research, but we have a lot of uh, very valuable and very experienced uh, faculty in our engineering school and who are uh, pioneers in the fields of artificial intelligence and computer vision and who are uh, working uh, in this field. So if you come here, you will find great opportunities uh, to pursue artificial intelligence with respect to healthcare. And again, I want to thank you and I want to end my talk with my best wishes for you. I hope you will again find the best match for your interest and I hope you will consider Medipol University. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Hi there, um, I'm uh, Mirai Budak from Istanbul Medipol University, the Faculty of Health Sciences and also the Department of the Ergotherapy. Uh, today I just try to explain you the therapeutic approaches in the new one and specifically for the Istanbul, Turkey and the, our university, what the opportunity that you will have if you come here. Uh, I can say you that the Istanbul is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Uh, empires. In addition to this, you will find an extraordinary sea view, especially the bridges connecting with the Asian and the European continents. Istanbul Medipol University is well positioned in terms of the landscape and the transportation with the campuses, such as two campuses in Kavacik and especially in the Golden Horn. In addition to this, it has many hospitals and also the medical centers where you can just actively see the patients and gain the practical experiences. Istanbul Medipol University continues to improve its quality in terms of science and also has neuroscience, genetics, EEG, cognitive rehabilitation, neuromodulation, language and speech, orthosis and prothesis, daily lab activities and also the technotherapy laboratories. And our university just offers you the endless opportunities for rehabilitation, the new one, with Faraday cage, EEG, FNERS, fMRI, Hocam, TTCS. Pardon, duyuyorum ama şu anda slide'ı mı paylaşıp paylaşmayı istiyordunuz normalde? Yani slide'ı slide üzerinden mi anlatacaktınız? Yoksa şu anda sizin ekranınızı görüyoruz, slide'ı görmüyoruz ama. Yok, ben slide'ı ayrıca, ekran gözüküyor mu şu anda? Şu anda sadece siz gözüküyorsunuz, paylaştığınız slide tamam. gözükmüyor, tamam değil mi? Slide, hayır daha slide de değiliz, slide'ı geçmedik. Tamam hocam, tamam. 
And also we have the TDCS, text, RTMS, and the virtual reality devices. Today, I just try to explain you the new opportunities about the rehabilitation, the future of rehabilitation and also the technological approaches. For the focal point in rehabilitation, we divide it to the gross motor development, fine motor development, balance, coordination, or like as the proprioception, postural control, activities or daily living or the participation. The therapy options in rehabilitation just include some different um, files, such as exercising, patient education, activity training, bimanual activities, or the, the neurodevelopmental treatment. The technology is a regional discipline that the people designed to prevail nature by using the science. With this technology support, we can correct the patient's posture functional skills for the upper and also the lower uh, extremities, aerobic capacities and the fitness, and we can just improve the balance and the coordination. Also, the cognitive and the educational skills and the functional activity training is really important for us. Technology achievements in rehabilitation includes the real-time biofeedbacks, like visual, auditory, or tactile. And also, we try to improve the performance of the patient or the healthy age adults or the child. The real life stimulation, the possibility of the multiple repetitions or the motivation could be just improved. And after that, we can support the patient by the exercising and the functional recovery rehabilitation. All of them just give us to the motor learning in the rehabilitation. And we also divide it to the movement control and motor learning. There are an association between them. We can talk about the skills. The skills could be just divided three different main topics, such as the individual, the task, and the environment. The individual should include the cognitive functions, the sensory and the perceptional skills, and also the motor and the movements. And in addition to this, we can just add some tasks to the rehabilitation. It could be intermittent or continuous. It could be just include stability or mobility or the manipulation for the upper extremity functions. And also the environment should really um, evaluated. And also it could be just include regulatory or non-regulatory skills, but all of them could be evaluated for the movement control and the motor learning. The motor learning could be divided three different stages, such as the cognitive stage, attribution, and the independent stage. The cognitive stage could not be think the first time, but it is really important because it includes some mental practices, the feedbacks, dividing the work into the pieces and the class environment. Also, it just uh, totally comes to the activity. And in the attribution stage, we will see the feedbacks, the proprioceptive feedbacks, the visual feedbacks, the transitions from the class to the open environments, and after that, the patient just passed to the independent stage, the functional independence life. Error-free practice is really important because the patient should feel independent in the activities of daily living. And also the increase in the motor skill speed and the variable environment, really important. So we talk about the basic elements of the motor learning include the technological rehabilitation, the attention and rich environment, mental practices, performance information, real life stimulation, normal neurostimulation, feedbacks, motivation, and the result information. All of them just give us the aspects of the technological rehabilitation. Of course, we have some solutions in there, like as the robotic systems, wearable technologies, all of them, the assistives, the virtual realities, 
or the motion sensors or tele-rehabilitation or web-based systems. All of them are the new approaches in the rehabilitation. The robotic rehabilitation is just a, couldn't just could be done in the therapeutic robots to just assist the mobility or practice targeted movement. These are the examples for you to understand what we have in our university. The exoskeletons, it just helps for walking on all of the mobility functions. The locomots or robogate, the other name. We have this in our physical therapy laboratories in our hospitals or geosystems. The geosystems also just help the stroke patients. And also we are focusing to the upper extremity functions. We called it to the robotic rehabilitation. The working with the stimulation similar to activities of daily living as such that you can see on the pictures. And in the upper extremity robots just enables for the gross and the fine motor functions by the synaptic connections. So we can talk about the rehabilitation process the cost, the difficulty of the adaptation, or using the different type of devices are really, really, really difficult for the patients and also the caregivers. So we can just give some opportunities and new approaches with these ones. Also the assistive technologies, the learning and the exercising by using the imitation skills, like doing like this. So they are just supported by the robots specifically, specially and developed for the rehabilitation. And also we have a virtual reality. The virtual reality is a stimulated environment which is just include the computer generated graphics. You can see all of the topics, all of the subjects in three dimensional and it is interactive. You should feel that you are inside there. And the use of the human senses, the virtual reality just do this and trying to do this in different ways. It is not just the image detection technology. It is just integrated by the accelerometers, glove joysticks, cameras, advanced imaging systems, vibration and impact providers or three-dimensional sound systems. All of them could be just included to the virtual reality. The virtual reality just starts for the rehabilitation model. We are talking about the central nervous system and also the phases between the participation environment and such as the personal or the body function structures. All of them just try to help us for the motor learning stages. Of course, we should talk about the ICF, the classification functions. This is the international system for us. If the patient has a disability, it should be evaluated by the performance in the activities, performance in the skills, the participation, the environment, and also the personal factors. They said that you could not just divide them to each other. Of course, the virtual reality application has some advantages. First of all, the applications can be tailored to the individual's level. It is a flexible option, like as the duration, speed, density, you can just uh, ad adjust it for the patient. And also the possibility to individualize therapy to achieve specific treatment goals. You can rate the difficulty level. It's really important because the patient just try to improve the functions and you should adjust it specifically for the patient. Providing the objective data with the reliable and the valid user detection hardware and it is an appropriate and timely feedback. And also it providing the numerical performance and the result information. In our university, in our laboratories, we have virtual reality glasses too. In virtual reality pro platform, I think so that you can just um, uh, try it in everywhere else, in like in technological centers. And I can say you that these glasses specifically it has three dimensional modeling, the mental imaging studies, which is just carried out in our universities too. 
Uh, it just help you to activity applications and it can just uh, lead you to enrich environments, the activities of daily living education. And it is also really important because in the rehabilitation, the patients just feel like in rehabilitation, but in the virtual reality glasses rehabilitation, the patients feel like in the real life. The development of the functional skills and our common phobias. It is really important because in the last days they are just uh, carried out to these ones. So I can talk to you about this type of studies that could be done with the virtual reality glasses. And also the video game, game treatments. We call it to the exer gaming. It is just coming from the literature. It is the therapeutic application of the video games in an exercise form. And the video-based game therapy or the exer gaming are the most commonly used forms of the expression in the literature. It is just normalizing the impaired sense with the auditory and visual stimuli and also providing the motivation because the patient feel like doing something else better. And also it is just help you to gaining a sense of accomplishment with the game and the opportunity to exercise in different areas. All of them in the result, it gives you the motor learning. We can just say that the exer gaming includes different types of uh, devices, such as the Nintendo Wii, Microsoft Xbox Kinect, PlayStation and the Leap Motion Controller. All of them has different type of focusing for the rehabilitation. One of them just focusing to the balance, the other is focusing to the upper extreme positions or the functions. All of them just gives the visual or um, audio uh, biofeedbacks to the patient and it is just um, realized that the patient has doing something else better. The Nintendo Wii specifically, just uh, focusing to the balance of the standing and it could be just uh, evaluated with the Wii game system, I think, so that you know it from the games. The balance exercises can be combined with the games and also there is a pressure sensitive balance board that we can just evaluate it to patients objectively and also the gravity. Nintendo Wii, just focusing to the lower extremity, upper extremity, and also the body. It is important that which area that you want to improve, which area that the patient has dysfunction, and which area that you want to focus. For lower extremity, it is really important to doing front to back weight transferring. For upper extremity, the coordination or approximation or hand-eye coordination also really important for improving and the body, the stink balance and the postural control also could be improved by the Nintendo Wii. Microsoft Xbox Kinect, as you see on the picture, has some cameras and some 3D depth sensors inside there and the, it's just help for the motion detection for an infrared projector. So the patient can feel that something else doing and the technology of the playing games with the hand, arm, leg, body movements without joystick or remote control plus the voice commands. This means that the patient feel inside this virtual world. The other thing that the lip motion sensor systems, the lip motion is this little black thing. And the, there is a USB that you can just transform all the uh, information from there. And also it's just a sensitive things that you, it can be understand the movements inside the hand and upper extremity. And also you can see your hand and the fingers like as this three dimensional system. This means that this uh, lip motion system the sensors can be just understand the wrist and also the finger movements sensitively to the one millimeter change in the movements of the fingers. This means that you can just help your patient to improve grasp and specifically for the fine motor activities. So it is just starts for the primary usage and after that it is just uh, adapted to the computer and after the games. The rehabilitation innovation is starts and after that the games of the software like as you see the yellow, blue and the red 
it just change the formation and get better. In our university, we have some projects about it with Tubitak and also the other universities. The Tubitak projects is uh, happening in our, uh, actually studying in our students. And we have some multidisciplinary collaborators of this. There is a nice software or rehabilitative games and we just try to develop this process. And consultantly to these thesis, like as the master or the doctoral thesis, and also for the graduate thesis, we just give these projects to our uh, students and they just try to develop all the other files. And our studies at the Istanbul University, Jarapaşa, and Istanbul Medical University Technotherapy Application Laboratory are ongoing. I will give you some examples. This is the physio soft balance system. I'm not sure that the videos will open. I think so that you, you will see in this video uh, the activity of the, actually the center of the gravity. There is a, a platform that you can just uh, stand on this. And after that, it just, it's, it's, it's a very sensitive sensors and it can be just understand and uh, I'm going to what's happening on the front or the lateral sides for your balance. On the others, we have some games for the balance. As you see, you can just uh, move your body to the lateral, front or back side. And after that, it could be improving by motivation. And on the other video, I can give you an example like this. Uh, while, it's, while the patient just playing this, uh, there is a really um, happy place for this, for the patients, because the patient just feel motivated. The patient just feel that it could be done by the patient independently. So this is really important. And at the same time, in this three, not three, but the two dimensional, but the patient feel like inside this virtual reality. And also this is a leap motion, physio soft leap ball and catch a pet system. The physio soft leap ball and catch a pet are the games that we developed in our laboratories, in our university. The leap motion controlled the applications and the range of motion could be measured, storing data and creating the graphics. And also they just help us to writing studies, lighting the uh, randomized studies and also the possibility to evaluate the progression numerically can be applied at home so you are just taking the stick and after go to home and adapt it to the computer and just um, continue to your uh, rehabilitation process the sessions inside your home and after we can just help you with the telerehabilitation and we can say you that this is the Turkish first application for this one. This is an example video for this. This is the leap motion. As you see, it just uh, understands that what you've done with your uh, hand and with the sensitive sensors, it could be just uh, feel that you are doing in this virtual reality system. And these are the Argo Active. I said to you that um, all of the names, the uh, terminology just change like as an occupational therapy, occupation or ergotherapy. We talk in our country occupational therapy to ergotherapy. So uh, we just um, decide that it could be named, titled the uh, ergoactive. Why? Because actively with the limp motion, you can just help yourself independently just in front of the computer. There is nothing else that you can do. You just try to uh, play the games, you just try to pass the level and pass to the difficult one. And that's all that you can improve your uh, function. This is an example for the activities of daily living in the kitchen. As you see, it is just using the knife and the other is just placing the books on the roof. So uh, it's just helping and thinking the patient like as in virtual, but like as in real life at the same time. 
these these games are just we have now uh, just yet two games because it's really hard for writing the other uh, things in, on the back side. But I can say you that we are just trying to write some studies about it. And also, it is just increase the patient awareness of the person with the auditory and the bio, visual biofeedbacks because the patient just see it and the patient just hear the voices. It is true or it is false. And I'm just, yes. This is the same thing for the knife, but it is just changing uh, which millimeter that you are just cutting with the knife. Maybe you want to five centimeter uh, cheese or just uh, one millimeter cheese. It's just changing what you want to done with the knife. And also uh, the other example is just uh, grabbing something else with your hand, with your fingers. Uh, in rehabilitation stages, we just give patients some uh, tools for doing this. And also we are just helping for the stretching and strengthening exercises but it is not enough for the activities of daily living in real life. So depending on this uh, idea, we just develop these games. And also the transferring tests and activities of virtual environment. As you see on the picture, this is a nine hole pack test. We always done in, for evaluating the fine motor activities. We can just help, uh, we can just bring with the help of the uh, leap motion. And also the other type of different type of grasping, uh, all of them just uh, help us for uh, the functional activities of the hand and the fingers. The other thing is the Kinect room. Uh, we can just try to understand the range of motion for the kinetic activities of the whole body. We have some range of motion, the normal or cutoff. Um, cut off things that for the range of motion and also we can just talk about the improving this one. Like as a stroke patient, like, or it's not matter that it should be, it should not be a patient. Maybe it is just an adult, a healthy adult or healthy um, elderly, it's not matter. If you want to improve somewhere else, if the patient has a shoulder pain, you can just use the Kinect room for improving and relieving the pain. So it's really important to understand what you want to do for this and it also helps you to evaluating the patient. The other thing is the PhysioSoft Kinect game that we can develop again with the other uh, university. Uh, in this one, as you see, there is a line that you should be in the straight and after that, if the ball just gone to the right side, you can just go to the cross side. It is just improving, just focusing to improve your balance, the coordination, hand-eye coordination and also the functional movements for the upper and body. And in addition to this, we have some web-based applications. Uh, we are calling it to the telerehabilitation. Uh, and also we have MEDES, the Medipol University uh, type of web-based applications. It is just ongoing. And I can say you that there is writing the patient's name. It is just from the new approaches from all the literature because you can just uh, continue and you can just control your uh, patient to the web-based application. There is nothing else that the patient should come to hospital, should come to the uh, centers. In these pandemic stages, in these pandemic processes, we will see that there, this, it's really, really uh, important to just stay in home. And in this uh, process, we just try to develop this type of applications to just control into our patients, like as multiple sclerosis patients. Our patients has some different type of uh, things that doing, uh, but it is really, really, um, it's really bad for them for just coming to centers. And depending on this, I can say you the web based applications is the best one. And also the telerehabilitation. In the recent years, we will meet that the telerehabilitation also just coming very popular because you can just, first of all, um, prescribe your patient to the structured exercising 
and after send them, them to home. But you don't know that the patient will done it or not. So you can just control to your patient with the telerehabilitation, like as this type of videos, pictures, or just calling it. And also in our university, in our department, we have a technotherapy application laboratory um, um, for the ergoactive and the other type of uh, therapeutic approaches. We will just try to develop new type of rehabilitation approaches in our laboratories. And also we have a neuromodulation uh, for the cognitive rehabilitation too. I can say you that it is a really, really big thing for doing this. And uh, this is the, there is nothing else that you can meet the other universities. This is the important uh, factor for our university. We have neuromodulation. The neuromodulation just try to modulate the nervous system in the brain and there is no pain there is nothing else uh, for the adducts, and we can do it with the electrical or the magnetic stimulation. We have transcranial direct current stimulation, deep brain stimulation, TDCS, or tax, or the transcranial magnetic stimulation. All of them could be done in our university laboratories too. Thank you so much for listening to me. Hello everyone, I am Serkan. I am alumni relations specialist at Medipol University career office. I was a student at this university. Uh, I studied physical therapy and rehabilitation, so I am physical therapist. I am currently pursuing my master education. I am both a student and a staff member at this university. I was born in Istanbul. I didn't want to study in another city because I know this city very well. Many career opportunities are in Istanbul, such as courses, sightseeing, food, cultures, tourist attractions, business world. I organized numerous events with my friends. For example, Unkapanı campus is in the center of Istanbul transportation to many places is very comfortable. Then I started my master's degree and I continue. I love this university, so I decided to work at school. So we can talk about career office. We work five people in the office. I work as a alumni relations specialist. Let's take a look at our work. You can lead your career. We work as a companion to the personal development of our students and graduates to the career office activities. We also support them in internship and employment processes. For example, career office works, job and internship opportunities. One of the main goals of the career office is to bring our university closer to the business world and to produce job and internship opportunities for our students. Second one, Bigel is Turkish abbreviation. For example, you have trouble uh, communicating. We can solve it with this program. Uh, the it's. It's, uh, it's mean individual development trainings. Bigel projects covers the works carrying, car carried out to contribute to the personal development of students to create their own awareness and to organize the organized training in line with students' demands. Next one, career fair. It is the study where many companions from business world interact with students in the foyer area of our university. MEDEP is Turkish abbreviation. It means vocational courses program. With MEDEP, it aims to turn the theoretical information that students receive in the lessons into practice. For this, those who are experts in their fields convey their knowledge and experience to the students. So 
We have human resources officers, uh, officers work in our office. Uh, so interview simulation we can do. It's a project that enables students to have an interview experience with professional human resource, resources specialist in, ad, in order to answer the expectations of business life correctly. Next one, CV consultancy. It is the counseling giving to create the best CVs of students or to improve their exist, existing CVs. Next one, career counseling. A psychologist work, works in our office. This process is carry, carried out by the psychologist of our office. Yes, now it's my job. Alumni relations, alumni relations unit operates under the career office operates in order to provide sexual, individual or academic support for graduates and provides graduate communication. Next one, career ambassador ambassadors, volunteers who work like a career office representative in their department, follow study studies related to their field, take part in career office activities and announce these activities to other students are called career ambassadors. We have nearly 15 ambassadors. Second one, alumni mentorship. It's a program where our university graduate is a mentor and our student is a mentee. Next one, career events. These are career themed events that bring together professional from and business world and students of our university. Peer guidance. It's a program guided by third and fourth grade, grade students to provide or orientation for new students. Next one, interview consultancy. This counseling program is for students to gain interview exper experience during the internship and preparation for business life. We can go on online studies in the COVID-19 pandemic. So we broke our programs to the online platform due to COVID-19 pandemic. We organized online career events that bring students together with the business world. We have become one of the fastest career offices that can do this. As a result of this, these studies, stud students had the opportunity to get to know the sector, sector, sectors more closely and had the opportunity to convey their questions to the managers. In this way, we influenced the students to increase their motivation professionally. Our works in this context, online CV and interview, interview consultancy, or online career events, online seminars, online alumni students meeting, online career counseling. Thanks for listening. You can visit our stand to get more information. Thank you. First of all, hi everyone. I'm Furkan Daşteren. I'm a student of International School of Medicine. I just finished the second year and passed the third year. I'm from Kayseri, which is located at the central Anatolia part of Turkey. I completed my high school education in this city and after taking the university entrance exam, I got accepted from Medipol University International School of Medicine with a 100% scholarship. Uh, that's how my Medipol uh, journey started actually. Uh, there were several reasons to choose Medipol, uh, Medipol for me. First of all, uh, it is the top university that accepts the most successful students in Turkey. Uh, you can also check it out from YÖK Atlas, a website of YÖK. Uh, lectures of the medical faculty are very qualified in their disciplines or areas. Most of them have been uh, in foreign countries, 
in some part of their educations or research careers. Also, they are very supportive and helpful, helpful uh, not only in terms of lectures, but also about your questions and extracurricular activities. Um, second reason, or maybe the most attractive one that was very convincing for me, was research facilities and opportunities of Medipol University uh, School of Medicine or International School of Medicine. Uh, we have a research center, a big research center called REMER, Regenerative and Restorative Research Center. Uh, in the first, second and the third year, uh, we have an additional committee or as known as uh, exams that we spend our at least one month in REMER or labs we choose one of the labs according to our area of interest and then learn researching. We can also do our own projects or participate uh, lab projects of professors. Uh, I have participated several projects so far and learned actually uh, very crucial things that will have contribute in my future life. Also, we have uh, double major opportunities in, uh, in Medipol University. If your GPA is, if I'm not wrong, uh, you can also check it out. Uh, over the 3.5, you can double major in uh, some areas. I'm doing a double major in computer engineering to apply uh, engineering skills on medical areas, especially in artificial intelligence and deep learning. Uh, that's all I think I can tell now. Uh, I'm giving to my uh, friend from also International School of Medicine, Ivan Abi Sosanda. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Ibrahim Etamam Amje. Uh, today, I will talk about myself and my university, which is Istanbul Medipol University. Uh, first of all, I am from Malatya. I have uh, I gr graduated from Mal Malatya Science High School. And I have ranked first in the uh, university enters exam in 2016. Then I got accepted by Medipol University. And now I'm a student of International School of Medicine at Istanbul Medipol University. Uh, I, I have chosen Istanbul Medipol University because of the uh, research opportunities and the, uh, also the opportunity that the university gave the students to do double major. Um, like Furkan, I am doing, I am double majoring in the field of engineering as well. So my, the project that I am working on is mostly about uh, the applications of the uh, engineering in the field of medicine. So uh, that's why I have chosen Istanbul Medipol University. Now I have, I have finished uh, third year uh, in my medicine education. I will start for fourth year. So I'm happy at my faculty. I have no problem. <laughs> That's all I, have, I can say. So if you have any questions, we can answer. Hello, thank you for joining me. Today, I would like to talk about design entrepreneurship at the Istanbul, you know, Istanbul Medipol University. Actually, design entrepreneurship and interdisciplinary studies constitute one of the significant reasons why you should study at the Istanbul Medipol University. I have a presentation for you that is based on student works. So let's, let me share my screen and then I will continue to present. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. So the title of my presentation is At the Crossroads of Design, Interdisciplinary Education and Entrepreneurship at the Istanbul Medipol University. Actually, this is a course that is lectured by me. My name is Ersin Alaja, by the way. Let me introduce myself first. Uh, I work for the School of Fine Arts, Design and Architecture, and I lecture this course with my colleague, Alex Tunel Basher. So, uh, so it is a one semester long study and we have students from the architecture department as well as uh, interior design department as well. Uh, 
So they form big groups and they study throughout the semester to produce good business ideas and uh, create a business entrepreneurship. Actually, what is entrepreneurship? Perhaps I, I can a little bit talk about it. Entrepreneurship is, is the act of creating a business or businesses while building and, and scaling it to generate a pro profit. This profit, however, is not necessarily an economic profit. This could be social profit as well. So therefore, the definition on, of entrepreneurship includes social benefits, social transformation or social change towards good, a better society. And here are the credits. Uh, you see the student groups. And today I would like to present to you three uh, design entrepreneurship projects that are called Bed and Body, which uh, applies to the hospitality sector. The other one is Try Me, that is designed for the online shopping sector. sector. And the other one is the e-touch that is for the dining experience in a way enriching the experience. So here are the student names and I may proceed now the first project. Here you see students, they also present themselves in the beginning of their presentation, which is something we really encourage students to present themselves as well. Okay, so this is a sh short definition of the designed application. Bed and Body aims to enable people to find the hostel that suits them and at the same time to meet people and find a suitable hostel body, a roommate, for example. You know, all the uh, online booking uh, websites or applications allow you to choose the best hostel or perhaps not the best, but uh, uh, most available for you. However, they do not provide you to choose your roommate. So what is special for this application? What special for this application is actually that allows you to choose lots of uh, selective items within the hospitality sector. Okay, in the beginning, we actually, all students start up the course with uh, an individual approach. They develop ideas throughout months, but after a while, we make them to select the best ideas by voting. And after this vote, uh, they form groups and students gather under some specific titles and specific projects. So this is one of them. And actually we teach them how to uh, analyze the marketplace. For example, there are lots of online booking sites for the hospitality sector, but how do I create something special for me? Uh, a benchmarking is one of the tools that helps you both to understand yourself, to uh, understand the marketplace, to analyze it, but at the same time to communicate it as well. So let's say there, you see there is a sort of crossroad and uh, you see four contrasting values on which uh, you can create a map and you can locate position locations according to your, according to your value scheme. For example, paid, free, they constitute the, uh, the, the contrasting poles in which between you locate all the companies that provide a service, online service on the marketplace. On the other hand, you have also functional and social, and so you create a sort of map. It's quite important to, to start up a sort of entrepreneurship. The other point is creating uh, create personas, creating users and then analyze them. For example, what is the hostel experience? How does it start up? 
you decide to go somewhere, you decide to go to travel somewhere, but then uh, you start up with reservation, then you have the hotel experience, then you have the travel experience. And in the end, perhaps you have a sort of big target that could be, for, for example, to find a friend, could be perhaps even more uh, interesting uh, to find a reason to have a happy life. So actually there are lots of layers. It is not only traveling, but also it constitutes lots of layers. So like in an op operation, you have to split it to layers in order to decide uh, wh what is not provided uh, in the uh, in, uh, in uh, today's services or online services. So find something, find the missing spot in order to inject your business idea. And you do it with personas. You create people, you create users based on your research. So therefore we demand students to do lots of research and this research, of course, involves not only users, but also the business model. How do you do the business? What is your value proposition, for example? Who are your key partners? Who are your customers? Rich people, poor people, outgoing people, introverts. There are lots of adjectives, lots of types of people However, you have to decide by researching all the layers of travel experience from online booking to the very uh, high ends of traveling. Throughout months, of course, students are also demanding to establish a cost structure, revenue streams. It is not only starting up a business, but it is quite important to sustainably maintain it. Therefore, students are very much demanded and asked to establish strong revenue streams. How are you gonna keep your revenue flow? And of course, uh, that's uh, quite obvious strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. This a design entrepreneurship provides you the design tools to create an, an idea and implement its business potential. And the design tools involve actually mood boards and stylescapes. This, uh, uh, this entrepreneur or the, the business idea should have a sort of visual identity, some aesthetical value, which will make it stand out from out the crowd. And here we see students' uh, identity, visual identity building involving colors, shapes, textures, etc. And of course, the, the application idea involves user interface as well. For example, the business idea involves roommate selection as well. Everyone do select the hostel. However, whenever we go to the hostel, we have no idea with whom we are going to share our room. Thanks to this application, people will be, able, will be uh, provided with the tools to choose the best applicable person for you. For example, I am a silent person. I don't like socializing very much. Uh, I go to bed early. So I'm looking for someone that will suit me, suit my characteristics. Of course, there are also other specific functions that allow you 
uh, to read other people's recommendations or opinions as well. So UI is quite important. It, uh, it requires a lot of effort for students to build up a very concrete approach towards business. And of course, it involves uh, a number of byproducts, such as business cards, brochures, in order to promote your business idea. And this is how it looks like uh, when people use the application on their phones. And here we see another street ad that promotes the business idea. Okay, we thank those students as well. And let's see the second project. It is Trimy. Trimy is created actually for online shopping. So it is a typical a brainstorming uh, brainstorming visualization, visualization uh, made by students. Here they uh, form the basic idea what are the needs when we do online shopping and what are the problems and how can we or how might we solve these problems. And here we have a narrative explaining how this idea could be beneficial for users. Actually, it uses virtual reality where you can uh, put the selected clothing item on your body. So uh, without physically trying it, uh, you will be uh, able to try it on your body virtually. And here we have a quite big stakeholder map uh, in order to make the business idea sustainable, you really need huge stakeholder maps, big land views, overviews, uh, that will help you to decide with whom you are going to work with uh, in various processes of your uh, business life. And here you have the benchmarking that I presented to you in the previous project the market analysis with four contrasting values, accessibility, less accessibility, sociability, less sociability, who are the other players in the marketplace and how the tribe me uh, will be located uh, on the map of these values. So the business model canvas, it is uh, about the business scheme, the ideas, And here we have a special uh, membership explanation, standard membership and premium membership. And here you have the TriMe wireframe. Uh, you can see the most satisfied products. Uh, you can try it on virtually. Uh, you can see other people's uh, comments and you can comment and vote as well. So it, it is a highly social online shopping application. And here you see uh, personas uh, that explain who will be the user for this application. And other persona. And here we have the analysis. Uh, students have analyzed their application idea with the existing market players. What do they offer differently? What are their positive sides? What do they differently than the rest of the market players?
Okay, well, quite, quite have a screen and you see the user interface design of the application. So you choose this shoe and so the shoe is applied on your foot virtually. So you don't really wear it on. It is virtually screened on your foot. So you have an idea prior to buying it, how it looks like when you will wear it on actually. So here we have the, uh, the website design, application design, other UI examples, uh, some promotional ideas, such as a business card like this, it's quite successful and it provides you the identity of the application idea. So I proceed to the last project. So here we see another urban advertising view, quite successful rendering. So our last project, project is eTouch. Uh, a project that is aimed to develop dining experience. eTouch is a, a social application that provides you with tools to choose uh, the specific restaurant that will also allow you to uh, book online a table, as well as to choose the specific waiter and comment on it uh, in order to uh, pro uh, provide other users with your opinions and comments. So here we see another analysis of the marketplace. What are the differences? What do other competitors do? What do we do differently? So here we see the benchmarking. personas, business model cameras, SWOT analysis, and finally we have the user interface. You, you see there are seats. You book the seats based on your need. How many are you? What are the shapes of the tables? And here we have the wireframe. So oh, it has been already 20 minutes. So I think I am in the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for your patience with me. And I hope I could give you a good idea about how architecture and interior design students are provided with the design tools uh, that will help them to develop their business ideas. Thank you for listening. And I hope to see you in Istanbul. Looking forward to it. Bye.